Hello, old dogs. This is your host and top dog, Bill Manicero. I hope you're having a blessed holiday and are getting ready for an amazing new year. Today's show is a special rebroadcast of one of our most popular episodes. I'm introducing the show under the banner, Best of Old Dogs REI Network Podcast. Well, enjoy. This episode of the Old Dogs REI Network is brought to you by Mino Studio. In a world where jobs are how most people make money, one man, one desire, one challenge dares to break the mold. Welcome to the Old Dogs REI Network, where we don't work for money. Money works for us. Coming soon, viewer discretion advised. Welcome to the Old Dogs REI Network, where cash flow is king. Real estate investing, the means, so you can enjoy your retirement dreams. This is the show where we cut right to the chase. No sales pitch, no long monologues, just simple how-to real estate investing advice, so you can earn the passive income you need to enjoy your retirement today. And now, your host and chief old dog, Bill Manacero. Welcome to the Old Dogs REI Network. I'm your host, Bill Manacero, and this is a show where 50 plusers and anyone else who wants to join us get solid, no sales pitch real estate investing advice to help generate real cash flow. This podcast airs twice weekly on Mondays and Fridays, and if you aren't already a subscriber, go to iTunes, type in Old Dog, spelled D A W G, find our podcast, and subscribe. Well, we have a very cool show ahead of you uh, here. This is, I've been looking forward to this for a while here. And uh, we have one of my favorite authors. Uh, I think it's probably going to be one of my favorite people here as I get to talk to him and chat with him. Um, Our guest today is Ken McElroy. And Ken is an author, as uh, many of you know, because uh, his books are highly recommended by us on a regular basis here, especially in our research section of our, our website. Um, he is the epitome of the word entrepreneur. And for the last uh, two decades, Ken has been experiencing massive success in the real estate world from investment analysis and property management to acquisitions and property development. With over $700 million in investment dollars in real estate, Ken offers a unique perspective on how to get the biggest return on investments. The books, as I mentioned uh, earlier, The ABCs of Real Estate Investing, The Advanced Guide to Real Estate Investing, The ABCs of Property Management, and most recently his book on entrepreneurship, The Sleeping Giant. As the real estate investor to Robert Kiyosaki of the Rich Dad Company, a former guest here also, Ken and Robert have co-authored several audio programs, including How to Increase the Income from Your Real Estate Investments, How to Get Your Banker to Say Yes, How to Find and Keep Good Tenants. Ken is also a chapter contributor in the newly released The Real Book of Real Estate. A champion and advocate for entrepreneurs and real estate investors, Ken has spoken worldwide at top industry events. With media appearances on television and radio, Ken also hosts Entrepreneur Magazine's Real Estate Radio Program, where he helps listeners navigate the financial and legal arenas of real estate. Never taking life for granted and continually giving back, Ken is active in the community, has been the chair two years in a row for the Autism Speaks Walk in Arizona. Ken has also served on advisory boards for Child Help, that's not Child Hope, which is our organization, but Child Help, and AZ Food Banks, where he conducted the largest food drive in the state of Arizona. Ken and his family reside in Scottsdale, Arizona. Well, Ken, welcome to the Old Dogs REI Network. Hi, Bill. How are you? Boy, I tell you, listening to that bio, it made me tired. <laughs> Sorry, I tried to read as fast as I could. But you no, know. I was laughing. I was like, man, I, 
you forget, right? You just do things along the way, and they they sneak up on you. You just just shouldn't accomplish so much, Ken. You know, it'd be <laughs> so much easier. <laughs> just say, hey, he's a couch potato, and uh, he's our guest. You know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, Ken, we are, I am so stoked to have you on. This is like really a, a thrill. I love your books, and uh, I I recommend them to everybody that's interested in real estate investing. Um, also, I I love your heart for giving back. That's also something real dear to me. And uh, autism is uh, also a uh, an area where I love to see anybody that gets involved in helping uh, support uh, efforts there and research and so forth. So uh, yeah, it's just it's just really cool having you on. Thanks, Bill. Yeah, I, I donate actually every all my book proceeds and everything to charity. That's what so, I heard. Yeah. That is amazing because they got to yeah, be yeah. selling a lot. I mean, it is. <laughs> yeah, you know, it was great. I was like, uh, well, after I, Robert convinced me to write the first one, Robert Kiyosaki, and, and I was like, oh, how am I going to do that? Like, I, you know, I wasn't even great at English, so I, I um, uh, did it, and then I'm like, well, if I'm going to do this again, I might as well you know, build a foundation and charity around it. And so then it kind of gave it, that was my inspiration then is to write these books so I could, you know, help others. That is so cool. That is so cool. Well, it's a, it's a privilege to have you on here an honor for us. And uh, I would, uh, I'd love to just share with the folks out there, um, you know, just your story, you know, you're, you're a young guy still. I don't think you even qualify to be an old dog yet, but, uh, you know, eventually you will. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. maybe on your 50th birthday, we'll have you back, you know, and Thanks. then we can, yeah, yeah. I, uh, you know, I, I just got really lucky and I was fortunate and blessed at a, my, um, uh, neither of my parents had any formal education. And, um, you know, I was always just curious about what it would be like to, you know, invest and and do things uh, on a larger scale. I, I happened to be fortunate enough to, to have a, a athletic scholarship, which got me into college. And then I took business. And then I, I – really what I did was I, I started – um, trying to be around people that were doing things and progressing and moving forward, no matter who they were. Um, at a young age, I kind of, you know, just inherently started understanding the power of having mentors and coaches around. I think maybe, maybe from my um, my athletic background. So I, uh, that's all I did, and and my first job was in property management uh, in college right at the end of college. And that's how I got into real estate is, is, uh, you know, managing properties in downtown Seattle. And, 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 um, luckily my, I had a, a background of working, uh, my dad was a, a contractor. And so I had, a, uh, I knew how to fix things. And so it was easy for me to, uh, what I didn't know how to do was collect rent and manage people, but I didn't know how to fix things. And so, you know, I had, I learned that I learned how to collect rent and, and and manage people and manage expenses and and do the accounting and all that. Even though I had a business degree, you know, you don't really learn it because it's all kind of book knowledge. So uh, that was my first real position out of school, and I I got a real estate license, and then I started buying real estate, you know, and and. Um, Started with one two bedroom two bath, used my own money. Then I ran out of money. Then I had to syndicate, and you know now we've got uh, ten thousand units, uh, almost a little over a billion dollars worth of real estate, three hundred employees, and we're uh, you know we're, we do ground up construction. Um, you know I own office buildings and self storage. You know fast forward twenty years later, uh, it's been a lot of fun. Wow. Wow. What a story. That is, that is so fascinating. What's really, uh, is real telling is the, you know, one of the things that a lot of investors really struggle with is the, the thing, the area where you started in property management, you know, you could, you could do all the numbers and you can be just a great, you know, analyzer and examine and get all the numbers right. But until you actually own those properties and you have to deal with the reality of tenants and and all the other aspects there, um, it it really, I mean, that, that that had to be real helpful for you, I would imagine, getting your first rental properties. Bill, it was. I didn't realize it at the time, but it was my competitive advantage when I when I got to the point to where I was looking at real estate. I knew most of the time whether or not I could fix it from a management standpoint. I could grow the cash flow. You know, manage the expenses, grow the income, 
grow the net operating income and create value. I knew before, and I still do, before I buy real estate, when I see it come through from whoever, from a broker or a, a seller, I can I can dig into the financials and the, and the rent rolls and really just see everything just jumps out at me so clearly. And so what I didn't know how to do though, of course, was buy them. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so I didn't know, I didn't know how to speak to a banker. I didn't know what they looked for in a loan. I didn't know how to raise money, you know, but I, I didn't know how to manage properties cause I had done that for, that was really my only job out of school was, um, a property manager for a very big company, uh, which is called Pinnacle. Uh, it's based out of Seattle and they have a couple hundred thousand units across the country and at the time they were small and, and um, it was just a pure gift that I landed there and learned um, you, you know how, the business from the inside and so then when I got the the courage to buy my own way back in the day I I actually I felt pretty comfortable with you know putting the team together and managing it because I had done that already now, have you ever hired an outside property manager or did you always do uh, sort of your, yourself or oversee your own team that uh, does it? I've done both, yeah. So we have property in Oklahoma and we use a third party there and, and um, yeah, so there's even today, uh, you know, so we have, uh, you know, it's – the property management is, is not a great field to make money in. It's uh, – in I think it's a kind of a – it's a opportunity to manage your own money, but it's really a tremendous amount of work. It's it's not a highly profitable business, but it's a great business to understand and to know. Yeah, this that's one of the areas. And I just wanted to touch on this a bit because this is one I know a lot of our listeners struggle with too. Is the yeah, I and mean, I've looked at it. I you know I look at these these property management firms and, and the number of clients they have, and just I just don't know how they make the money to be able to to really do anything. Yeah, it just is there's such a, a small margin. And I, I notice at least with my own properties that, you know, the more attention you can give tenants, the more service and you, know, you can provide that kind of thing, the, the better it is for tenant retention, for being able to increase rents and so forth. But it, it, these guys, you know, they don't have the time because they don't have the money to be able to do that. So when I hire an outside firm, I mean, I, I, I could tell you, Ken, you know, maybe 90% of them are not that great. And, yeah, uh, that's um, true. Yeah, I've, I've bought – well, I bought property management companies. I've personally formed uh, half a dozen of them, sold some of them. Um, you know, the one I have now is – you know, 300 people in it. And, uh, I started from, from ground up and, and so I've, I've run the numbers, the scenarios and, and, uh, all over and the property management industry has some incredible people in it. And, uh, if you can find them, you know, they're worth their weight in gold. Uh, they're very hard to find. And, and, um, and then the, as you, as you pointed out, the business itself is really skinny, and I, I, you know, you have to be a pretty large company to to really to make money, you know, because if if they manage a bunch of small properties, you, you can almost calculate the revenue, and 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 it doesn't really support all the overhead and and the good property manager full time, and you know all those things. So there's a there's a lot behind the scenes that if if owners knew, uh, it would help them select the the best property management company that they could is is the most important uh, thing, and and the individual inside of that company is probably the most important thing. Yeah, that, that's that's got to be key. I mean, and, and making sure that the person in charge has really got the integrity and, and other attributes that, you know, you, you're partnering with that person. That's probably, at least for me, and I invest only out of state, that is my key person. Uh, you know, I, we build boots on the ground in other areas and other, you know, jobs, but that person is gotta be good or you know i i'm i'm doomed for <laughs> failure you know yes well you know looking at your investing and you've gotten in a lot of different areas here and it's it's neat to hear you know you've got self storage you've got commercial you've got all these different areas what what would you say is uh, sort of your biggest mistake uh, that uh, that you've really learned from that you can share with our with our listeners 
Gosh, there's so many. I mean, I have them, I think, every day. <laughs> um, I don't feel so bad. <laughs> yeah. So I, I, I think probably one of the bigger mistakes that I think about is I lost, um, I lost a bunch of investors' money. And um, it was about 10 plus years ago in a condominium conversion that we did. And, um, you, you know, we, I think we were, you know, what happens sometimes is the markets get, so, I just had this conversation with somebody this morning. The markets sometimes get so hot and frothy that you start to lose your awareness of just some of the basic fundamentals and you get kind of caught up in the hype. And uh, certainly that happened to me. Um, now, not exactly. The market didn't fall out from me. What happened was, as you as you remember, when the during the, um, the the financial crisis and the banks started, you know, shutting down and closing and things like that, we had um, on a condominium conversion. You basically take an apartment building. This one was 300 units in Scottsdale, Arizona, and you sell them off individually to, to investors and or homeowners and and then they need the financing to be able to buy those and so what happened was the financing for the what we call the takeout buyer uh, went away overnight so there were no, there was nobody lending to anybody that could buy them and therefore we didn't have any buyers and so um, yeah, as a result of that I lost a bunch of money my uh, some investors we brought in lost a bunch of money, and um, you know just the unwinding of all that was extremely painful. Wow! Would you learn from that that uh, going forward that uh, you know you might better be able to prepare for something like that? Well, I learned a lot. I learned um, that you know you really got to overly communicate to everybody, and some people put their head in the sand. Yeah, I've invested in things independent of my company and people lost my money and then they go dark, you know, <laughs> so that's one that, you know, I overly communicated. I got people on the phone. I met with them in person and, and just, you know, was ready to take my lumps. And, um, that, um, surprisingly didn't happen because of the transparency that, that we showed. But, um, that was one. And then also I think what happened is, um, you know, I, I want to stick to models that I, uh, have more control over some of the risk, you know, in that particular case, there were a bunch of market risk things, you, you know, right now people are talking about market risk and, you know, any, anytime you're buying something today and you hope that it's going to be more next year, that's a, that's a big risk in my opinion. And, um, but that's what most people do. And, you know, we, we have more of a, I think I have more of a philosophy around what I call forced equity, which is when I like kind of what I was describing in the beginning, if I buy a building for $10 million, uh, before I buy it, I know operationally I can improve the value to say 15 before I buy it. And that's forced equity. And that's done. That has nothing to do with the market going up or cap rates going down or anything like that. It has all to do with basic fundamentals of rent growth and expense savings and growing the net operating income. That's great. That's great. Well, looking um, uh, also back, uh, yeah, I still zeroed on a negative there. What, what about on a, a positive standpoint? When do you think the sort of the one thing you've done in, in real estate investing that ha has really just Man, it just blew you away by how how um, how well that 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 particular effort uh, resulted in 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 success for you. Sure. Well, I, I I one of the one of the blessings I had as a young man when I started was meeting a uh, gentleman from New York that owns the he he's got fifteen thousand units in Manhattan and um, he was in his eighties at the time. He convinced me – this is before I met Robert Kiyosaki. He, he convinced me that I should buy properties and not worry about market cycles and make sure that they cash flow and not put too much debt on them. And now, you know, this was a long time ago, but I – I I really heard him because here was a guy. He's on the Forbes list, one of the richest men in the world, and at the time. And and then fast forward, Kiyosaki has this cash flow model, and and you know it's right under my nose the whole time. And and so you know there's this whole 
you know, do I invest for capital gains? Do I, in other words, do I try to time the markets or do I invest for the long term on a cash flow model and don't sell anything, which was his name was Leonard Littman. And that was his model. So um, so that's what I did after that condo conversion mistake in the early 2000s. Um, we changed our model completely, and um, surprisingly, Bill, we don't sell anything. We we buy for the long term. We make sure we're not too highly levered, which I know requires more equity, um, and we make sure they cash flow, and then we really focus on our property management folks and, and pers developing them personally to make sure that they can perform at the highest level. Uh, to to generate the cash flow that we can at all the time focusing and paying attention to market timing because it does make sense in some cases to sell even though that's not that's really way down on our on our uh, priority scale this is really neat to hear actually because I you know it's it's really funny. Um, I, I, I interview a lot of investors and it seems like the guys that have been doing this the longest, uh, one guy comes to mind, I don't know if you've heard of Samuel Freshman, but uh, uh, he wrote a book on syndication. In fact, he was one that kind of looked at the model that was used here in LA, uh, in the movie business for syndicating movies, and uh, started applying it to real estate. And a lot of the, the foundations of this book that he wrote you know, have, have been adopted you know, internationally in, in real estate syndication. But it, I asked this guy, and he's he's pushing ninety. And uh, and I asked him. I said, you know, out of all the things that you've done, what do you, you know, what do you regret, or what you know, what is the the one thing you wish you would have done differently? And he had just one word. He just said, sell. <laughs> <laughs> and that was it. He just said, you know, I was uh, – I he'd buy these buildings in downtown L.A. He'd buy it for a million and three months later sell it for two million and he'd be running around, you know, waving his flag saying, look what I did. Look what I did, you know. And, and then, you know, years later he sees that same building is worth $100 million today and he's going, why did I ever sell that? And so – he changed his whole model, and he's still investing today. A guy goes into work every day. Uh, you know, he buys for the long term. He, he just he he just disregards market cycles and just buys for the long term. And so, yeah, asking you, you're a younger guy doing this, and uh, and I know kind of a lot of investors, and the investors are used to that three to five year, you know, five to seven year uh, exit strategy. So how do, how do you deal with that on the, on the investor side if if you're if you're buying for the long term? Well, I think it's a really, really good question. I, I have heard of Sam. I've never met him, but I'm a big fan, and uh, I do know that uh, he has that philosophy as well. I, I, you know, there's. It's interesting if you go to New York or San Francisco or any of these um, markets, and you're raising money, which is kind of what's happening right now in our market. And, you know, it's private equity. And so it's managing someone's pension or, you know, whatever it is. They, they're, they're all at three to five years, you know, in and out. And, and I don't blame the model for them because, you know, they're basically managing, you know, other people's money. It's not really their money. And, uh, you know, they're trying to churn these, they're trying to time markets and they're trying to generate the biggest return, the biggest yield that they can. But the truth is they're, um, you know, once they sell, they have to place that money again. So to Sam's point, to Mr. Litwin's point, um, you know, I look back at deals that I did in I, I wrote, wrote about it in my first book. You know, I bought this beautiful project on the on the Oregon waterfront. Well, that property is, you know, we bought it for 30 million bucks. It's a hundred million dollar property today. <laughs> and I was like, oh, my gosh, like I wish I would have kept it and and it just cash flowed the heck out of it and maintained it really well. And so those it's no different than if somebody if you look at how much your house, how much you like you live in Southern California, how much did you pay for your house 15 years ago? It's the exact same model, just times whatever. So I, I you know, these 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 pearls of wisdom from guys like Sam or Mr. Litwin um, sounds like they're about the same age. You know, you have to be. They're they're looking back and seeing the mistakes that they made. Um, to answer your question about our investors. Uh, they, I'm very clear with what I want and 
if if they're not aligned with me, then I don't take their money. That's it. So it's you know I have a philosophy, and you you know they're either on board or they're not. I I never compromise uh, my long term vision based on equity. Do you do sort of cash out refis at certain points too? To, oh yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, so so you may but, do that at three or five years. Oh, we do those a ton. Yeah, yeah. We've, okay. we've, we've probably done that on. I probably returned over a hundred million dollars in the last three years just on cash out refis. But the, you know, those are different. That's a tax free event. We own the property still. You know. Right. Wow, that's 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 neat. That's actually refreshing to hear because I, I I think there's something to that too, and and I think uh, too often we get in this mode too that uh, let's just keep flipping them. It's like we're flipping properties, you know, except it's a it's a little longer time <laughs> span, and you're and you're constantly. You know, you just it never stops. You're just constantly doing that. And I, I think for for folks like like me and, and and others listening, you know, they they don't they don't want to have to constantly you know flip. Pro- they want to get a, a base of good solid properties that are generating a solid cash flow for them and and uh, be able to kick back a little bit and enjoy their retirement years. You know? Well, I, luckily, I did it. I, I, you know, we we bought a bunch of apartments. We converted them to condos in the early 2000s, uh, probably 3,000 units uh, in various cities, and I don't, I can't remember the exact number, but I bet we were in the four to five hundred million in sales. And um, guess what? At the end, Bill, guess what I owned? Nothing. <laughs> Right. You're Honestly, right. Honestly, because, you right. know, I bought, I bought all these buildings. We <laughs> sold them for huge profits. So, one, I owned nothing and I had to do it again. Two, I paid massive tax because, you know, we were selling all these at big profits. And three, I put together this huge team and we had all this momentum. And when the market stopped, you know, obviously you have to let them all go back into the market. And so, um, you know, there's – you know, and on the positive side, I made a bunch of money, and we established a bunch of relationships. You know, both on the debt and equity side, uh, it made me understand uh, the market cycles and all those kinds of things. But at the end of the day, Bill, I was—I basically owned my house, <laughs> and you know, and and some and some small real estate, and had a bunch of cash. So I was in the exact same scenario as anybody else. Wow. And so you, you you couldn't because you changed the property you you couldn't do a ten thirty one on those could you um, no because no, no, no. they're condos now right so it's it's yep. kind of different yeah you, wow. you basically take you know a big apartment building and you sell it off piece by piece to you know however many you have wow that's that's a great great lesson learned there. <laughs> um, you know, you mentioned a little bit about the markets too, and I wanted just to go there as, as well. When you are looking to acquire new properties, uh, uh, you know, I, just reading your books, I understand that you do you do a market analysis to look at that market to to see if it has the attributes that you want uh, that would show that you know jobs are coming in the area, rents are strong, uh, you know, all the all the right stuff. Um, what, what what kind of factors do you usually look at? At. And, and how do you kind of, you know look at the, the the country as a whole for these types of markets? Yeah, so it's a good question. I well, I always when I, if I'm asked this question, I always I always kind of like to talk about you know people ask why did why was Wayne Gretzky so good? He said because I always skated to where the puck was going. I never skated to where the puck is, and I think that's a good analogy for this particular question because what happens, what I see is when a market gets really hot, a lot of people jump in just like skating to a puck on where it is. And I think that the, the guys that are making the money are the ones that are trying to figure out, okay, what market is going to be next, you, you know, and, and I'm not saying you can't make a lot of money in, in current markets that are hot, and you can, but you got to be very, very careful. Powerful in the way that you purchase and the way that you leverage and and all those things, um, and you know, you know, some markets might have a very short cycle and some might have a very long cycle, and so some of the things that that we look at uh, obviously is you know the if if you, you, we kind of start with 
with population and employment. And, you know, those are kind of bounced around and talked a lot about, but they're, they're really big, big factors as to why real estate is bulging or not. And then from there, you have to look at your overbuilding and oversupply and is there demand there? And, and you know, you just look at your really basic supply and demand. So, so just, you know, I'll give you a couple examples. So we made a couple mistakes by investing in some markets that were heavily military, for example. And those markets, um, you know, are they're full as can be, you know, one of them is down on the Arizona and Mexican border. And, um, you, you know, when, um, you, you know, when the government's, uh, uh, doing really well and, and the, and the base is full, then, you know, those, those, uh, markets are completely full, but the minute there's a cut in funding or the minute they're deployed or, or whatever that might be, a market like that could move in my, my world. It can jump down to 75, 80 percent occupied in, you know, in, a, in a matter of months. And so those are the kinds of things that you have to be careful of. The same thing can happen uh, with, with anything. With you know, I'm from Seattle. You know, when Boeing left, it hurt the market, you, you know, and moved to Chicago. And, and so, you know, as, as these employers move around and, and um, you, you know, they create population growth in particular market segments, you know, State Farm just went through a big reorg and they, you know, they built a big corporate headquarters in Tempe, Arizona and another one in Richardson, Texas, and they were adding thousands and thousands of jobs in those particular locations. Well, these these companies, they announce that information well in advance of actually even coming and because they have to hire people locally, they have to relocate, they have to build buildings and all those kinds of things. So these are really small uh, methodical moves that you can decide and make if, if, um, if you're thoughtful. And so what happens though is now everybody's like, oh my gosh. You know, because that area down in Tempe, Arizona, for example, is now the highest rent on an office for office buildings in the in the entire market. You know, just just from that one move alone. And so, these are things that are pretty common sense, but people don't, I don't for whatever reason, they don't pay attention to. And if they really saw that State Farm announced, for example, I'm just picking on them right now. You know, three or four years ago that they were going to move here, and so you know now everybody's so surprised. And it's getting all this press. But the truth is, um, if you're watching to where the puck is going, then you can do very, very well on retail, office, industrial, commercial, condos, whatever. You know, as markets get oversaturated, oversupplied with people uh, from both population and employment growth. So that's just one example. Yeah, that's great. That's a great example. What about uh, municipalities? Um, that's the one area I hear that, that never downsizes, <laughs> you know, where you've got this huge like county structure or city, you know, that uh, has you know, all these office buildings and, and, you know, related to the civic structure of a particular area. Um, is, is that something that you factor in in, in some of these analysis? Yeah, I, you know, the it's, it's interesting. I mean, the city... Uh, you know, we, we certainly pay attention to government workers, government employees and all that kind of thing. But, y you know, you really got to dig a little deeper to see whether or not, you know, what's in those buildings and whether or not it's a, it's a sustainable department. Maybe it's got some budget cuts coming down the road. So we personally have stayed away from anything like that, um, you, you know, generally – but certainly it's always on our radar and, and um, uh, you know, mostly we're, um, you know, we're kind of focused more on, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, the bigger employers and how they're moving around. You know, we just here in Phoenix, you know, we've had we got completely annihilated with the with the last uh, housing boom. And, and, you know, and so what happens when there's no housing and there's no development, all that kind of stuff, the tax base goes way down and all of a sudden the city, the municipalities, the state revenues go way down. And so you have this flux, 
of you know money and, and so it's not always a good thing to um, you know hang your hat on you know is, is some of the municipalities and and the the state uh, governmental buildings and 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 things because I've seen them kind of contract and expand as as the economies kind of rise and and fall great good good comments I'm going to touch one more time on property management again because I, I, I'm, you know, I'm seeing it, you know, as a as a landlord, that you know, managing properties is where profits are made or lost, and um, I'm just wondering if there's some tips that you can provide for us that are trying to manage our properties better. You know, just some real practical things that we could do just to uh, to make that uh, a, a little bit better process or more profitable. Sure, sure. And I, I would actually take it back one more step, Bill, because – and I'll just give you a couple stories. There, there's, there were um, – when I was managing property for other people for in the property management world when I first started, there w- were lots of investors and people that were buying – at what I would consider to be the top of the market, and so they're buying, you know, and I'm just I'm just picking this, but let's say let's say their rent on an apartment was a thousand dollars a month. The broker's telling them next year it's going to be twelve hundred. The year after it's going to be thirteen or fourteen hundred. The year after it's going to be fifteen hundred. Whatever. So they have an expectation. And if there's a turn in the market and the rent's a thousand dollars next year and a thousand dollars a year after that, you know their returns and their expectation based on what their understanding of that investment was uh, is significantly different than what the market can bear. And I think that's an important point to bring up because what happens is a lot of times. That's when you start to see turnover in property managers. There's rarely an investor that says, you know what, I made a bad buy. You know, I I probably should have been a little more diligent in my underwriting, and I probably should have not have, have bought this with the anticipation of rent growth going up so much over the next three or four years. That's something that hardly anybody says. What they do is they fire the property managers, and and they say, you know, and their expectation of what the market can bear is unrealistic. So I wanted to make that point because. That is for sure what's going to happen soon because a lot of the market's really heated in most most of the uh, municipalities, and and so you're going to see a lot of uh, property management turnover, uh, you know, especially if they syndicate because the the syndicator will never tell the money or the equity that. You know, hey, I, I, you know, I, I, uh, my underwriting was too aggressive. You know, just those things. They just never say those things. So, so what happens is it all kind of rolls down to the property manager, and the property manager is the one that's kind of on the hot seat to basically perform uh, based on what an investor's belief system is at the time. So, in a perfect world, if the investor bought correctly, and the the market is let's say 95 96 100 percent or whatever then the expectation would be that the property manager should meet that expectation um, you know and from that in that kind of market you're going to see year over year rent growth and you know uh, all all kinds of things and you're going to have a very very happy investor a very very happy relationship between the property manager and the investor um, it's when um, it's when those things don't work perfectly, and my 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 belief is is that most property managers are are pretty decent people unless they are incredibly busy, and you know are really missing. Um, you know, really missing the point of of getting good tenants in. So to answer your question. The number one problem that people have, it's pretty simple, is that they rush on sticking people in that shouldn't be in there. That's the number one. And so there's all this vacancy pressure on rentals all the time. Somebody moves out, you know, then um, all of a sudden there's pressure on the property manager, pressure from the investor because there's no revenue coming in to fill that thing. And so they start to compromise 
on that. And so that's that's the biggest mistake I see is they put people in that maybe have had a rocky uh, uh, history credit wise or maybe they've been evicted before or, you know, uh, they're skinny on their on their income to be able to barely make the rent or, or whatever. So that's probably the biggest and the most um, problematic of all issues. Man, that's great, great advice. Um, good, good stuff. Especially, you know, the, uh, <laughs> to the, you know, taking a step back and looking at those that are putting together their typical value add deal, right? You reduce expenses, you increase income. I mean, it just comes like all in the same sentence there. And, uh, yeah. um, but what really, if you have no place really increasing income because <laughs> you, you, you know, you're, you're making projections not based on, on reality. So that's a, that's these are great great comments. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna get some more advice from you here. I'm I'm uh, gonna have you kind of sit back and and imagine here. Okay, you're talking to uh, a parent or a father-in-law or, or mother-in-law, and um, they're in a situation where they're looking for this additional income um, because it's just it's just tough and they're trying to make ends meet and they're, uh, at the same time they're trying to enjoy their retirement and, and you know not not worrying about oh gosh can I afford this plane ticket to go visit my grandkids graduation you know uh, what what kind of advice would you give to somebody that's in that position um, and how would they get started in real estate what, what what steps would you recommend that they take to you know look at real estate investing as filling that gap. Sure. Well, I've had lots of these conversations, as you can imagine. Um, you know, I just actually had one this week with an attorney that makes a lot of money, and you know, you know, he was he he wants to invest in, in things with us, and 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 I I I have them almost weekly. Uh, I could have multiple conversations uh, exactly around this, and and so. So what I I think what happens is that everybody's looking for somebody that they can trust. That's number one, and so you, you know that's probably the most important thing is to you want to if if somebody's just trying to make fees and flip really quickly and um, doesn't have a, a you know I would consider to be a a, a nice track record, then you would probably want to. Uh, shy away from that at least initially because they're going to be on this big learning curve. They might have a great idea. The market might be hot or might not be hot or whatever. It doesn't really matter. But everybody's looking to jump into real estate and really the team uh, that extends to the the people that they work with, you know, the appraisers, the real estate people, the contractors, the subcontractors, any, you know, the title people, the escrow people, all those things are a very important part of a team. And um, not to mention, you know, partners and equity and debt and banks and financing and, you know, all the property management folks and everything else. It's all one big thing. And so a lot of people discount the momentum and the 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 wisdom of of the entire team to pull off something and so um that that would be uh that would be the you know the unknown that, but those are things that i always d drill into for people i was like well who is it what have they done have they been through a couple corrections or at least one you, you know and and you know because people that have been through corrections are you know successfully are, are a little more resilient than those who haven't and you know is it their sole source of income and all those kinds of things are important questions for people that that i'm I would be investing in in um, the other thing is uh, which we haven't even talked about is the market itself. You know, is it does it make sense financially? And and so um, you know, Kiyosaki and I have this saying that, um, and it's interesting. I was speaking with him in New York. Um, this is a while ago, back when Trump was still speaking with him, and and so we were doing this event actually with Trump at the Javits Center in New York. And we were walking through the convention center, and there's these beautiful girls, um, you know, promoting these big 
uh, high rises in downtown New York and they had these big brochures and they were gorgeous and they were glossy and they were like a book. And he, you know, I can't remember the, I can't even remember where it was in New York, but you can, you can, you know, in view it. And so we're walking through and I'm just grabbing brochures and, and, um, of every kind from, you know, Costa Rica to Belize to New York to whatever. And cause it was a real estate conference. We go back into the green room where we're speaking and it hit me and I said, you know, it's interesting, Robert. I said, every deal, most of the deals that I do don't really even need a brochure. You know, I said, it's usually done right on a napkin, you know, when you're sitting down over lunch or something and, you know, the numbers are what they are. And, and I mean, you still have to put it into a business plan, but I said, it's, it's interesting because it's a lot of times the bigger the brochure, the worse the deal. <laughs> and, and he laughed and he's like, you're right. I go, look at these, look at these. You know, I don't know if these are good or not good, but the truth is, is that if you're having to sell this hard to get people's money to buy things, there's a reason. And, you know, because most there's a lot of money out there and the money flows to good deals. And so, um, you know, and so I find that. You know, um, if if the philosophy of the person taking the money or the investor is not really thought through, um, you know, it's pretty pretty simple to draw some of that out with just a few questions. You, you know, and so but when before I buy something, I know what my rents are going to be, what my expenses are going to be within reason. Generally, I know what my target NOI is going to be, if it's going to be in one year, two years or three years. I know what my value is going to be generally and I know how I'm going to get out, uh, you know, with using more debt through a cash out refi at some point. I know all of those things before I buy it. And so those are the, that that's a system and that, you know, that kind of, you kind of walk an investor through, you, you know, they understand that. But if it's, I'm going to buy this building because there's a lot going on in this market and, um, you know, in two or three years, we're going to sell for a lot more is not a philosophy. It's not a plan. It's just timing and risk. There's a lot of risk and it's gambling. Um, and so you have to package it up. So that all those unknowns are are known, and um, and only then and then should you invest in the, those kinds of deals. What if they want a, a more active role? Let's say they want to acquire their own properties. Um, would you recommend they start small? They start big? That uh, you know? Uh, let's say they're looking at multifamily. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think um, that's a great question. I, I, I always say it depends on how much time you have, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that because, like myself, sometimes you know having your you know your own money invested and you're, you're in the trenches with it all um, is a very, very, very important part of you know long-term understanding and understand how money works especially if you turn it over to, to someone later um, what I've what I've what I continue to see however is people say I mean I just I just actually uh, was talking to somebody about this last week you know they they, they invest in a 300 or four hundred thousand dollar house and they you know they think oh I'm gonna make a hundred thousand on it so they put 50 in and guess what? They lose <laughs> all the time and the money and all that stuff, uh, you know, because the their exit uh, wasn't realistic, you know. And so I find that a lot of times the the lack of experience of hey, we're gonna we're gonna completely gut and renovate this house, and it's going to be worth fifty or hundred thousand dollars more than anything in this neighborhood. Well, that just isn't gonna happen. That's not unreal. That's very unrealistic. Uh, from the beginning. So their flaw was that they didn't completely understand the exit and and uh, they thought putting all this money into something when if they would have stepped back from it all, uh, um, you know, maybe even asked that if they were investing in someone else, uh, you, you know, you're not going to sell. The market is only going to bear what it can bear. It might be the first one to sell, but you're not going to sell it for that much more. Um, and, um, so, so I think what happens is people get caught up in the exit plan and, and they become too optimistic on that. And then they make their deal work, you know, uh, and they've put all this time and effort in there. So I'm a big believer of people doing it themselves. 
And um, but I always say that they really be very realistic on where the market's going, where it's taking them, you know, what they're able to do. And and hopefully they have the time if it's going to spread out, you know, over six or nine months, then it's probably not a good idea, you know, because markets can change, you know, in a course of a year pretty easily. Right. And and if somebody wants to just buy some rental properties and just to be able to uh, hold on to those and uh, um, through the retirement, uh, how would you, you advise they start in, in that uh, front? Yeah. So, um, you know, there's there's some great ways to invest in, you know, through your IRAs and things like that, too, as you know, um, that I, I, I think people should constantly continue to look at. Um, but again, finding a partner and investing in their vision is the best thing that you can do. So we have about I think about 350 to 400 investors in our firm now and they they're always calling me always texting me what are you working on what you know what's going on in this and they're active they're they're active asking questions the right questions uh, most of them about you, you know what I see in the markets and where I'm going and, and that's the kind of relationship I think you want most people are used to the you know and I I've, you know because of tax planning I've got money in 401ks and you know with financial advisors too but the truth is is I have my I have my money with a big firm I won't mention the name and um, I think the financial advisors turned over three times in maybe six or seven years. And I've actually even ne met, I've never even met them. And, um, you, you know, it's a fair amount of money, you know, and, and um, the, it's just, it, it cracks me up. And that's what people are used to. They're used to, you know, hey, give me your money and, you know, I'll call you when I need you. And I think that, um, you know, which is usually, hey, I think you should invest in, I think you should invest in this and this and this and this uh, because they want to make commissions off of you. But um, I think that you need to create a relationship with whoever, whoever it is you're investing with. Uh, and it's a real true relationship, you know, unlike some of these financial planners that um, not all of them because there's some very good financial planners. But, uh, you know, it's it's a very active relationship that needs to be manifested and, and worked and built um, over a period of time. That's great. Great advice. Uh, you know, I, I think that communication aspect, like you said, is is key even uh, – as you know, you use the example of the the condos. You know, if if, if people know exactly what's going on, and you're, you're you're kind of going out of your way to you know keep them in the loop, um, I, I just think the relationship is going to be that much better, and and being able to uh, you know just just uh, you know that there, there's not. That, you know, there's that transparency also that's in, in place too, so that they, you know, they can see everything and they know what's going on. I think any investor would, I, I know as an investor too, it, it, you know, that's that's what I want to see. I want to know that, you know, I, I, everything that's going on, you know, as best I can, um, as uh, as if I have a, a chunk of that uh, equity there. So. Yeah, I, I spend. We have all. I I offer all our active investors to fly in. I pay for it. I pay for, you know, a two day weekend. Basically, uh, we bring a whole team up and we talk about our assets, what we're doing, what we're investing in, what we're working on, how we're trying to increase you know, the net operating income and I pay for everything. I pay for the rooms, I pay for the food and everything. And, and, um, you know, I create the relationship and the door, you know, open that door and I want them to, I want to be uh, all, I want my whole team in the room, good or bad to be able to face the fire or to get great, uh, the thanks, you know? Um, and, and so it's extremely important to have that, that venue, and that relationship with the investor. That's great. Great. Well, what's, what's ahead for your, your company, uh, Ken? Um, what's really exciting you about uh, the future of, of your company? Well, the market's really hot right now, and so you, you know we're we've been refinancing, and uh, you know we're building. Uh, we have about a hundred million under construction, ground up new construction apartments, uh, and we have some self storage that we're doing. And um, you know, uh, for my partner and I, Ross, 
you know, we're, we've been focusing a lot on operations on, you know, how do we improve our, our net operating income? How do we really, really manage our expenses really, really well from taxes to insurance, to repairs and maintenance, to marketing and all that stuff. And we brought some of that stuff in house and, you know, our whole platform's up online now, social media and blogging and things like that and driving traffic. And, and then on the, on the income side, you know, we hired a person full time to, to manage our, uh, you know, what we call other income, which is a uh, non rent. And, uh, so I'm excited about, you know, dedicating people to focusing on some of the little details behind the scenes on, you know, how, how are we growing the, the net operating income and, and the cash flow for the investor. So that's kind of what we have going for 2018. That's great. That's neat. Well, I have kept you a long time here. I could probably keep you another couple of hours, but uh, <laughs> that wasn't the deal. So I don't want to. <laughs> Darn, you know, I should have made that deal. But uh, we have a, a little session we call at sort of the end here. We can pick your mind for resources and things. Uh, we call it our wrap it up session. And we uh, ask a series of quick questions and you respond with, you know, hopefully uh, prompt answers. It's just kind of like a lightning round type deal. So if uh, you are ready for that, I'll go ahead and we can uh, wrap it up. Okay. First question. I love asking this question of authors because it's always kind of tough, you know, to look outside of your, your, you beyond your books. But what is your favorite real estate book? The Art of the Deal with Trump. I love that too. That's a, I actually have been listening to the audio version of that. That's great. Uh, how about your favorite just general business book? Um, I just finished a great book called Never Split the Difference by Chris Voss. He's the number one uh, negotiator for the FBI on on um, hostage negotiation. And uh, I, I read it three times. I love that book. That's great. Does it help you in, uh, in negotiating better deals? <laughs> Oddly enough, it's a, it's about relationships more than anything else. It's, really? It's, yeah, it's interesting. He. What he says is you never know you, – you have to figure out what the motivation of the the person that held everybody hostage is before you can do anything. So it's about asking questions and building a relationship. And uh, it is it is about hostage negotiation, but he said how can you negotiate when you don't know what their motivation is and what they want? God, that's great. I, th I bet your wives would love that uh, book for husbands. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, what, how about your most valuable website for success? Boy, I, I, I cover a lot of this. So I actually, the one I follow every day, it's called All Pro Dad, believe it or not, has nothing to do with business and it's all about raising families. I love it. I love it. That's great. I'm going to, I'm going to listen to that one. That's uh that's excellent. How about uh favorite app on your phone, your smartphone? Um, well, I've, the girls here have got me all fired up about social media. So right now I'd say it'd have to be Instagram because they're trying to build, you know, our company presence. Um, but, um, and that's kind of fun. It's kind of fun to see, you know, cause it, I'm so, I'm, I'm, I am a little bit old school, uh, with the way I came up on, on PR and marketing and it's all changing. And, and so it's so foreign to me, Bill, that, uh, <laughs> I, you know, like, why would I ever put a picture of me at my desk on, a, you know, on the internet? Like it, I, but people apparently like it. So who knows? Like, I'm, learning, I'm learning. Yeah, me too. I only had, I, I, it was like two years ago, I got my first Facebook uh, page or whatever, you know, so I'm, uh, I'm trying to learn too. In fact, advertising and PR was a whole different world when I was in it. I mean, you know, that's when we used to like, you know, uh, put wax on the back of the ads and stick it on a board and, you know, display it. Now everything's all digital. It's pretty funny. Uh, <laughs> anyway, how about your favorite quote? Who? Um, be the change you want to see, Gandhi. Uh, excellent. Excellent. Okay. And our final question here. Um, if, let's say there was something apocalyptic that happened and, and you lost absolutely everything, every asset you had, uh, every all you had is $1,000 in cash in your pocket. Okay. What would you do with that $1,000 to rebuild what you had lost? Oh, I wouldn't use any of it. <laughs> I would I would uh, have no problem building an empire, uh, but I would not have to use one nickel of my own money. Well, okay, so tell me what you would do. 
What would uh, why wouldn't you use any of them? Well, you know the the interesting thing that's that's the biggest obstacle for most people is they think that they need money to make money. It's just not true. You, you know, there's a zillion people out there with money and don't know how to make money, and so you just have to you have to be educated enough to know how to make other people money, and then you their money will flow to you no problem. That is great, great advice, great advice. Well, Ken, uh, I'm sure there's a lot of folks listening here that uh, want to find out more about to you, what you do, your company, and uh, it, it, what, what, where should they go to find out more about uh, sure. Ken Mack? Yeah, so the company's website is MC Companies, M C C O M P A N I E S dot com. And then people can reach me on kenmcelroy.com, so K-E-N-M-C-E-L-R-O-Y.com. All right, great. Well, we are coming to the end here. We're not quite done yet, um, but uh, we have a tradition here and that everyone, every one of our guests has to basically close us out with their best old hound dog howl. Okay, so I don't know if you were warned about this in advance or not, but, you know, if not, it's better because then, uh, you know, you can just be totally spontaneous here. So we're going to just uh, open this up to you and you can just give us your best. You know, I, I know you're in Arizona, right? So, yep. so they got like coyotes, right? And so, so I mean, you, you kind of got the idea of, you know, what, what we're looking for. So uh, if you can just go ahead and close us out with your best old uh, hound dog howl, that would be just oh. awesome. That was more like a coyote or a wolf, but that's uh, how's hey, that? That was good. That was excellent. All right. <laughs> well, Ken, it has been a blast to have you on here. And uh, we have, uh, gosh, you just got a ton of valuable information for our listeners. I just can't thank you enough. No problem, Bill. Anytime. Uh, also, for all those out there, our old dog listeners, we're, we're just grateful for you as well uh, to listen to the show and to be a part of what we're doing here at the Old Dogs REI Network. Uh, please note everything that uh, we discussed here. Uh, the, there's also going to be links to uh, Ken's website as well as the books and some of the other resources he mentioned uh, in our show notes, which are located at olddogsreinetwork.com forward slash blog. And uh, you'll be able to get a recap of everything we talked about there. That is the show for today. Uh, remember, cash flow is king and real estate investing the means. Until next time, keep moving forward and may God bless. Thank you very much for visiting the Old Dogs REI Network. We would greatly appreciate if you would stop by iTunes and let us know what you think of the show. We would love if you could subscribe to the podcast, give us a five-star rating, and write a review. The more ratings and reviews we receive, the more visible the podcast will be to others. Thank you.